Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I want to talk to you about Sea Launch. Not to be confused with Sea Launch because nobody needs to launch aquatic mammals into space, except possibly ULA. But yeah, Sea Launch, it was a collaboration in the early 2000s, which basically launched rockets from the middle of the sea. And, you know, they did this from about 1999 till uh, 2014. They hit financial troubles in 2009 and, yeah, finally stopped launching in 2014. But yesterday, uh, or it sounds like Sea Launch may be making something of a comeback. Yesterday, Russian Deputy Prime Minister Yuri Borisov stated that there is a plan to fly rockets from the platform again. They'll have to develop a new launch vehicle. Uh, since the final launch of the, the Odyssey platform has been sitting in port next to the Sea Launch Commander, they were parked at a port in Long Beach in Southern California until earlier this year when they finally left port and headed off to Vladivostok in the east of Russia. Now, Sea Launch is a pretty interesting operation for lots and lots of reasons. The concept of launching rockets at sea dates back decades. There are several US and Soviet studies starting in the 1960s. The main attraction of a Sea Launch is that you're able to pick your launch site, and by launching from exactly on the equator, it permits much more efficient access to equatorial orbits. And this is very important for geostationary satellites. When you have an equatorial launch, you don't need to do that expensive inclination change maneuver during the orbital insertion. So a satellite can have much more fuel left in reserve for those station keeping operations and therefore last longer. Anyway, following the breakup of the Soviet Union, the concept of sea launch became potentially strategically important. The future of the former Soviet space program wasn't assured by any means. The Baikonur launch complex was now part of Kazakhstan, and it was entirely possible that one day that country might choose to stop allow Russia from launching rockets there. So within days of the breakup of the Soviet Union, the head of NPO Energia, Yuri Semenov, he initiated studies which would ultimately form sea launch. The former Soviet states had lots of rocket technology, lots of experience with launches, which could actually be a, a really good source of revenue for the states. And the problem was they didn't have a lot of money to really get things started. Uh, by 1993, Boeing had joined Sea Launch as a major investor with deep pockets and lots of connections to Western space technology providers. The search for the launch pad involved looking at converting old ships, they had uh, you know, various large ships available. Boeing actually apparently wanted to use an old super tanker, but then they found the Ocean Odyssey. The Ocean Odyssey was a 30,000 ton all-weather drilling platform, which had been built by Sumitomo Heavy Industries in Japan and had launched in 1983. And it had worked in various places in the world in all sorts of inhospitable locations, like off the coast of Alaska and in the North Sea of Scotland. But by, in 1988, it was working uh, an oil field in the North Sea when there was a gas blowout that led to a fireball that killed one of the crew and damaged the drilling equipment. And after that, it had been moved to port and more or less spent five years rusting in a Dundee port. So the Odyssey was acquired by Kvarner Maritime, who then became part of the consortium with the task of refurbishing the platform into a launch site. Now, as for the rocket, there were many options for a possible launch vehicle. There were no lack of rockets that had been developed by the Soviet states, but the winner was the Zenit. It had been developed in the 1980s with an idea to be an ideal booster to replace the aging Soyuz design and to perform some of the missions the Proton did because they wanted to get rid of the Proton due to its toxic propellants. The first stage was also used as a strap-on booster for the massive Energia rocket used to launch the Buran rocket. So the Zenit was a three-stage rocket. It used high-performance, closed-cycle rocket engines. The first stage used the RD-170, which is the four-vert nozzle version of the same engine that's used on the Atlas V, which has only two nozzles. In fact, actually, as I understand it, some of the RD-170s they used were originally shipped as part of the Energia program, and then they took the boosters back and took the engines and reused them. So the Zenit was actually a Ukrainian design built by KB Yuznoy, uh, and it used Russian engines and a Russian upper stage. So, the partners were NPO Energia, Boeing, Kviner, and Yuznoy, and they 
together created Sea Launch in 1994. Now, in addition to the platform, they also had a support ship that this was going to perform like rocket assembly and payload mating, and it would act as a command and control ship operating at a safe distance from the platform. The Sea Launch Commander was commissioned and it began construction in Glasgow, Scotland in 1995. It took a few years to get everything built and configured and there were all sorts of technical and legal and international problems, but they signed up a number of customers. Hughes, Hughes agreed to like 10 launches and Space Systems Laurel added another five. And in March 1999, they successfully launched a dummy payload into a geostationary transfer orbit, paving the way for their first commercial launch of a direct TV satellite in October of 1999. So Sea Launch was based out of Long Beach, California. Most of the rocket and the payload assembly were performed on the Sea Launch Commander while it was sitting in port. There's like an entire rocket assembly hangar that runs the full length of the ship inside it. And it can support assembly of two Zenit rockets simultaneously. When the rocket is you know, constructed, assembled and ready for launch, it would then be carefully transferred to the Odyssey launch platform while both vessels were still in port, they would have a connector bridge and they would roll the rocket across that. On the Odyssey, they would then perform checks on the vehicle, make sure it was okay, raise it to a vertical position, and once they were satisfied, they would stow it horizontally inside a hangar for a trip to the launch site in the Pacific. So the Odyssey has a top speed of about 12 knots and it would take about 10 days to cover the 2,900 miles to the launch site in the Pacific. The Sea Launch Commander was a bit faster, so it could actually stay in port a couple of days longer before following on with its partner. The launch site was on the equator at 154 degrees west. That's about 1,400 miles or 220 kilometers south of Hawaii. And that left a lot of open ocean downrange to the east for the expended stages to safely splash down. At the site, the Odyssey would then fill its tanks with ballast with about 20,000 tonnes of water to stabilise it. And then the commander would park alongside, they would have a, a bridge between them while they were preparing. And when the rocket is finally prepped and ready to launch, all the crew move over to the commander, which then moves to a safe distance a few miles away and manages the launch. So in the 15 years that it operated, there were 36 launches from the Odyssey, all to geostationary orbits. There were telecommunication satellites, TV satellites, and my favourite is four satellites named Rock, Roll, Rhythm and Blues. These are the XM satellite transmitter satellites. Uh, there were four failures, one of which in 2007 was a failure on the pad which resulted in a massive fireball. The engines failed a few seconds after launch after debris from the tank entered the turbo pumps and everything stopped working. The rocket basically fell down through a hole in the deck, through the flame deflector system and exploded. And as catastrophic as this looks, it wasn't the first massive fireball this uh, platform had been uh, subject to. After refurbishment, the Odyssey launched again less than a year later. But Sea Launch ultimately failed for other financial and political reasons. The customers began to dry up even before the 2007 accident. The company declared bankruptcy in 2009. Boeing became a little bit of a problem partner early on as they acquired McDonnell Douglas, who was building the Delta rockets. And Sea Launch was then kind of competing with Boeing. But that didn't stop them investing one and a half billion dollars in the partnership. But after the bankruptcy, they claimed that they were owed 500 million from the other partners and resorted to lawsuits to make sure they got them. They got their money. The launches became few and far between, and you know I'm sure Sea Launch was really happy to offer up the Sea Launch Commander to Hollywood as a location for the opening action sequence in Captain America: The Winter Soldier, which is, by the way, one of my favorite Marvel movies. But even if there were customers, Sea Launch was ultimately doomed by politics. Russia's annexation of the Crimea Peninsula made the Ukrainian-Russian Zenit. Essentially impossible. There were a few Zenit launches after this, primarily using hardware that had already been delivered. And you know, now the Zenit sort of lives on a bit in the Antares rocket, which the first stage of it is very similar to the Zenit, but there's still a lot of difference. That's used to take cargo to the International Space Station. So yeah, now uh, six years after this hiatus, 
Having cleaned up all the debts, the new owners of Sea Launch have moved the hardware to Vladivostok, and there might still be room in the market for Sea Launch's service. They do have a unique launch facility with a legitimate selling point, and Russia doesn't have any low latitude launch sites, so they in particular have a lot of penalties when it comes to geostationary launches. What they lack right now is a rocket that fits the bill and manages all their requirements. It'll be interesting to see what they choose to use. And of course, you know, even if Sea Launch never flies again, we also know that SpaceX's Starship is planning to use sea platforms for super heavy launches. It's entirely possible that the next Sea Launch is not, in fact, by Sea Launch. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.